My guest today is Uwe Dulik, Professor of Economics at Queensland University of Technology in Brisbane, Australia. The subject of our talk today is Uwe's work on credence goods, but we won't stop or start there, actually. Uwe, welcome to the show. Thanks, David. Nice to be here. First question, why do people pay taxes? Um, so I, I did this work with, um, uh, um, together with a colleague of mine who actually had very early in, in like where, where I did my Korean goods work, he started to look at um, uh, this question, why do people pay taxes? And, and his work was um, saying that there's something like tax morale. So it's not just um, that we pay taxes because we are worried that otherwise the taxman will catch us. Um, because we haven't paid taxes and, and then there's all the shame and maybe the, the type of penalties that you have to pay. But um, what more or less you find, and, and we find actually similar patterns in, in, in our work on credence goods, that, um, um, that people are driven very often to do the right thing. Mm. And um, there is a willingness to pay taxes um, in people, in particular if you, if you can make the case um, for what these taxes are used. And so t tell me about like, so the, the specific mechanism you identify there, which is this feeling of, of guilt, right? Yeah. Or the, it, it, like it's a very interesting study because you, you as a heart rate monitoring yeah. device you put on them, right? To test how they felt about pay, pretending to pay taxes and not tell us yeah. about the method. So, so we, what we are we're interested in is, is what more or less what's the level of stress yeah. um, uh, that is caused when you, um, when, when you consider, so to say, whether you should pay taxes or not. And what we found is that there are people for, for whom if you tell them, well, this is the tax you have to pay, um, and we can see the behavior that they show as well, that are just honest in their tax and they're not particularly stressed uh, about mm. it. Uh, and, and, and we actually could find a little bit more that if you are very, um, like, in this experiments, uh, and, um, like it's, it's a simulated situation, in this situation, those people that are very dishonest um, they also are not very much stressed. For them, it's okay. maybe it's just a game, uh, and they just don't really think about it. Maybe they don't have this type of morale, uh, and for that reason, it doesn't cause any stress to withhold the tax. Um, uh, and then we had the people actually that were a little bit um, um, like that paid some taxes, but not all, that showed the highest levels of stress, which is more or less showing that um, it, it's, it's, it varies between people, um, but also it causes most stress um, if you're in this in-between range. That's, that's like, it's not very cynical, <laughs> mm. right? Um, when, I, when, I, when I'm reading your, we're gonna come back to credence goods in a second, but I read your papers on that and a few other papers where you analyze the game theory of things, right? You have to assume the maximum cynical person because you're trying to design the boundaries of how, mm. what decisions people can make. But then what I think we find in these instances and in many other instances that you study is that it just doesn't apply. Like for most people, it doesn't matter. They'll, they don't need that stuff. And I'm wondering like, how do you as an economist analyze that kind of behavior in any kind of rigorous way? Mm. Like for me, and that's like, I do feel it's, it's a little bit um, a minority position currently as a behavioral economist. I do actually feel this, um, this theory gives you a very good benchmark about um, whether purely selfish behavior can actually get you to, to good outcomes or not. Like in, in okay. the credence goods example in general, like the, the work that we do there is shows that if everybody behaves, like it's almost a, the perfect Adam Smith-like world, uh, if everybody seeks his own benefit, we, we end up in a good situation and if we have the right institutions, right? So if we know that this is the case, then I think we can really use a lot of standard economic instruments. Uh, but we also show, and that again, in the Korean schools example, you see that quite nicely, there are plenty of situations where that's not the case. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and we just talked about the, the resistant to, to nudges and smack, and if we would go into policy land I think if you look at current discussions, it gets even even stronger. Um, so pushing people in certain directions doesn't work either. Uh, and and a lot of the other work that that we have then done, in particular the behavior work, shows that there are enough drivers for good behavior in in uh, in, in, in in us, in most of us. Um, uh, and and we can build on that. And we should actually be much more. Um, open and, and maybe much more 
we, we, we should and we could do more research about how we can, for example, get the right people into the right spots uh, to make decisions. That, that would be uh, how, I, how I see that. So do I think economists are cynical in their approach or is the homo economicus a particularly cynical um, model? I think only in the way it's sometimes what I would call first year economics, how it's taught there, a very right. selfish um, uh, type of, of problem. Uh, or, or approach um, and um, you could go further and, and actually take into account that people care about others um, like the, the the work on tax honesty is an example where one way to look at it would be saying that people actually have preferences have, have um, uh, like derive utility feel better if they are honest uh, and that drives their behavior and, and, and we should just should make the right assumptions that people are not just um, um, selfish and only caring about their own benefits. Mm. We do care about others as well. The our, our governments, so credence goods, we should talk a little bit about what that is. So this is when you buy something without knowing, whether without being able to verify the quality that uh, of the good itself or that you even received it after you've paid for it, right? And I, th I think of, and I'll, I'll allow you to redefine it in your words, but uh, I think of government services as a kind of credence good for, think about this, an insur a, 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 I'm thinking of a social insurance scheme or any kind of collective action where you know, you're, you're, you're putting money in and somebody else benefits, right, somewhere else. That's like you're paying taxes for social welfare, for social security, for healthcare perhaps, for roads, maybe not your roads, maybe somebody else's roads. Um, it seems to me that government services are a kind of credence good, true or false? Mm. Um, I, like to some extent, I do feel they are. Um, I, I just want to be careful um, about how, like we, we need to go a little bit more into detail. There are two aspects of credence goods that are interesting and you cover just one. Okay. Uh, interesting one that was particularly important in the, in the, what you could call the agricultural economics type of literature um, um, where we talked about characteristics of goods that are not um, uh, that you're not necessarily uh, are able to observe um, in general like the way we talk about credence goods is, is saying um, it's not just the quality of the good that you won't be able or that you may not be able to observe uh, but it's also you're not sure about what you really need for uh, um, uh, in a specific situation Yep. Um, so, like the the example uh, that I w like to work with, because I think it's the easiest, but we could talk about plenty of other examples, and I'm pretty sure we will touch up on them. Is this example of seeing a car mechanic? Sure. So, if you have this feeling that your car makes this funny noise or something is not really right, you you go and see a mechanic, and we all know this type of weird feeling. Hey, it's pretty hard to describe what's wrong, um, but we also don't know what is wrong, but we are pretty good to, to know when the car is fixed afterwards. The noise is gone or it has sure. whatever all the traction that it had before or the power, whatever you want to, whatever you complain about with your car when it, when it is in this problem. What we don't know is whether the it was just simple repair or whether really an expensive part or whatever needed to be uh, replaced. So that's the type of situation we talk about um, that I find maybe most interesting uh, to think about in the Credence Goods example. Um, that, that you as somebody who buys something doesn't even know what he or she needs. So sometimes low quality will be fine. It does everything that you need, right? It may be just a screw that needs to be replaced in your car and it's a five cent thing and, and it's a five minute job. Um, but if the car mechanic says, well, I needed to replace the whatever, the muffler in your car, um, you wouldn't be able to tell whether the screw would have done the job or not. Mm -hmm. So this, so that's useful that you make that clarification because my next question is, you know, if, if not knowing whether or not you got the thing in the first place was uh, is is, a, is an important feature of, of a credence good, what was fascinating to me is in one of your papers, you actually come across the result where the verifiability of the product mm -hmm. doesn't actually become an important feature and whether or not the um, the market outcome is good for the customer, right? Yeah. So verifiability in this kind of sense doesn't matter. Now to me, this is like, 
real head scratcher. So if verifiability is part of the definition of a credence good, how could it not matter, um, yeah. economically speaking, in the outcomes of trading in credence goods? Yeah, I think the, the interesting bit is um, like in that uh, in that paper, when we talk about verifiability, we talk about what you could call the verifiability of the input. Um, okay. So you, 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 you are not able to verify whether you got a high quality um, treatment good um, service or a low quality treatment good or service right? right so that's what you can't verify um, uh, but you can verify whether it was successful that you were treated or not so this okay. is like if we talk back to if we go back to the mechanic example if the mechanic just tightens a screw or replaces a couple of small um, parts in your car you won't be able to observe that really Right, um, and, and you, most if you just likely, patch it up versus truly yeah. fix the problem, is that what you yeah. mean? Like if you just uh, but put if, a you, if he puts in a new muffler, most likely you, you could check if you would want to check, right? Maybe a little bit inconvenient, right. like um, I think in that paper or or, or the type of discussions uh, that we had around that, we talked sometimes uh, about uh, you can ask a mechanic to put the replaced parts into the boot of your car. Mm -hmm. Right, and that way you have some sort of evidence. Okay, you must have replaced that because there is something in my car there, and, and there's another one there. Right, you could still cheat, but it's much much harder. In principle, we can think about that people are able to um, uh, to verify whether they received the service. But that's different from being able to verify that the thing works afterwards. Okay. Right. So in principle, once you take your car from um, from the repair shop. You could have somebody else look at the car and saying yes the problem is fixed mm -hmm. right and that's the type of verifiability of outcome that we talk about when we discuss liability so i think the result you're talking about is um, that if we have this problem that you can't just uh, observe the the quality we need to have a way to um, get the expert to guarantee that he provides the service uh, or, or more or less gives you an outcome that 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 you wanted to to achieve yeah so here you're talking about what the big result in the paper uh and at least your i think it was 2006 paper uh was a, the the kind of the parsimonious model of credence goods right so what are the things that have to exist hmm. in order for the credence good market to function you mentioned liability that means if somebody under treats you 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 needed you needed heart surgery and they gave you i don't know aspirin Right, mm -hmm. you sue them, yeah. <laughs> right? You attack them because they've violated the law because they've, you know, they've had a fiduciary duty that they breached. And then, what is interesting about the, the verifiability point is that you don't actually need to verify whether or not. And this is the point where you know what you were expecting to see, if I got this right, is I, if in the absence of verifiability, they will always just they will always give me, um, or they will they will sometimes overcharge me was that what it was mm -hmm. there's was, there's was some there's some mechanism there that i was missing am i yeah. about that right yeah yeah no no um if, if i if i have a liability then the, what will happen is that that you like in this artifact in this model right so it simplifies a lot of um uh, aspects um um that you pay more or less a fixed price so the you, you get a service contract um um uh, now I recall um, the, 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 in the US you have the system of health. Is it called health maintenance? Or HMOs. HMOs. Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, so organizations, I think. Yeah. Yeah. yeah right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, no. Yeah. Not. Not health maintenance. Health membership. Yep. Yeah. But we. Uh, this idea you pay is uh, health a fixed That's fee and they yeah. ensure they keep you healthy, so to say. Right. So. Uh, in that sense, you do pay sometimes a high price when you get only a low quality treatment, and and you could interpret that as as uh, as overcharging. Uh, mm -hmm. Like we don't explain, we, we don't call that overcharging. We, when we discuss overcharging, it's more this idea that I give you something um, and claim it is something else, which and the yep. two have different prices. Um, uh, but but that's more or less the the finding that we have there. If you have uh, liability, you can actually end up in a situation where you pay a fixed price and 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 uh, the expert makes sure whatever he delivers works. And you know, and when it comes to verifiability, though, when you mentioned that it, it doesn't matter, the 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 surprising result there w was that you were expecting the lack of verifiability to have negative consequences, right? 
uh, and it didn't. Yeah. In the presence um, of liability. Exactly. Like I'm, I don't know whether I I expected that not to happen. Um, okay. I, I think we we like I would like to to move on a little bit in my work and and, and start moving to the experimental work on that. Um, yeah. The interesting bit is more that uh, is the argument uh, in in this um, uh, in, in this theory that you need either liability or verifiability for uh, the Korean goods market to work. The Korean goods market to work with this very the homo economicus type of agents on both sides, mm -hmm. and the argument is slightly different, and 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 um, that's what I find interesting, and I think it shows us this power of or why why it is important to move a little bit more move away from this uh, model of perfectly rational behavior in the case of liability the simple insight is if we have liability we can actually put so to say the expert into the driver's seat right um, because right. we just say well you know you, you, you write a service contract and the expert makes sure that your problems get fixed um, but but he more or less decides, and there are economic incentives for him to to use the most cost-effective way to more or less fix your car or solve your your credence goods problem. Mm -hmm. If we have verifiability of inputs, so this idea that you can observe as a customer whether you get the small or the um, the large type of treatment, the high or the low quality type of treatment. Um, you rely on customers actually thinking about what are the incentives for the experts um, to behave. Right. You have an incentive to make sure that the expert doesn't make more profit out of selling you a too high quality compared to, to the right quality or too low quality compared to, to, the, to, 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 to um, the right quality. And, and competition more or less then forces experts to do uh, to choose prices that keep them in uh, give them the right incentives to to deliver um, uh, what is best for the customer so it rec it relies a lot more this type of verifiability of input relies uh, relies a lot more on 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 people understanding this type of strategic interaction that that's going on it's much more game yeah. theoretic, so to say, in in, in, in the way it, it's argued. Um, and like, if you're okay, and I, I take the bridge to to the the, the, the experimental work on that, um, then um, what we find in the lab study or, or the experiments, and, and I found that really interesting at the time, where the theory says it doesn't matter whether you have liability or verifiability. In the experiment, we find liability works almost perfectly not perfectly nothing is perfect when humans behave but pretty close like the the type of prediction work while verifiability seems to fail dramatically and seems to fail uh, with respect to the behavior of um, uh, the experts they, they don't react correctly to to um, um, this type of uh, incentives and the same way the the customers don't predict the behavior of, of experts correctly and so the in the in that result that you uncovered there uh what was you know i i i'm trying to get what decide figure out whether they got the paper right but the what you discovered was the reason why it didn't matter was that the providers were actually doing the right thing anyway right uh, or at least that there was a distribution of providers and you could pick one that was going to do the right thing yeah like uh, the, uh, the you paint point out a very important thing and i think that that's already the next step in the work so what we found even if you even if the theory would predict um people should completely whatever exploit customers or the market shouldn't work at all we still find the, the market still works reasonable well in the sense of you get about efficiency of about 60 percent uh, and, and that's due to the fact that I would say maybe about half of people just do the right thing. It could be a little bit more. We, we could talk about uh, um, like, like how we get to this 60% uh, efficiency. Um, so there are enough people out there that, that do the right thing independent of the institutions that we have. Um, so the baseline, so to say, compared to the theory that should have said nothing should happen, is much better because there are enough good people out there that do the right thing independent of incentives um, and it's more about what happens to the rest 
like do we get the institution so to say to get us close to the 100% efficiency that you could have and I think we ended up in the paper in a, with around 90-95% which is um, uh, to some extent um, uh, due to the fact that people just make mistakes uh, but we only got that out of this liability setting Hmm. Um, so it, it did work to some extent. I think it shows that maybe customers in, in, in these situations, in this in this uh, simulated um, uh, situations, in the experiments that we did, um, were much more willing to interact when liability um, was there. But it also forced then efficient behavior of of the experts to a much larger extent. So uh, uh, one of the things that another result from that, I think it was that same paper, the paper on the experiment that I found really interesting was that reputation didn't matter. Now let me pause and tell you a little bit about my perspective mm -hmm. because I work in the insurance industry, right? Mm -hmm. And and not, well, a little bit in the healthcare insurance industry, but for the most part in the property casualty insurance industry. Mm -hmm. And I came across your work because I first heard about Credence Goods like two months ago. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, what? There's this whole corner of economics that I didn't even know existed. And it really baffled me. And I, I think a lot about trust, right? Mm -hmm. And the insurance industry has, uh, is, I mean, it's, I, I think of it as like a double-sided credence good where mm -hmm. the insurance purchaser buys an insurance policy from a company they don't know if it's going to work. The insurance company sells something to insured and they don't know if that person is going to screw them, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? It's like, are you going to file a fraudulent claim? Mm -hmm. And so nobody knows what's going on, right? There's not enough mm -hmm. information about what will happen in the future. Like it's a really complex forecasting exercise, right? Both sides. And so it's given me this framework for thinking very carefully about how, 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 how the economics of the insurance industry through this credence goods lens. Very interesting. And we're going to get into broadening the, I think, the definition of credence good because you do that a lot in your, liter in your yeah. literature too. Um, but I, I say all that at this point to say that the number one thing when you talk to insurance agents that matters, and I would say this for most salespeople, is reputation. Mm -hmm. And in your experiment paper, you make the point that reputation actually doesn't matter if you have these other institutional um, uh, factors in place. So maybe you could explain that result a little bit. Yeah. Like I find, uh, for me, the easiest way to explain, uh, explain the result is to think about uh, what liability actually is. And I okay. think in situations where you can't have hard liability, we, we just talked about the medical context, right? Yes, in principle, um, if, if, if you need some sort of uh, more severe intervention with your heart and not just aspirin. Um, yep. uh, the, the doctor should be culpable and you should be help, able to hold him responsible, but it's pretty difficult to do that, right? It's, um, it's a lot of money in, in this type of legal cases and, and, and um, I think it, there's a lot of people that would be avoid, uh, would not be whole, uh, held liable and, and can avoid this type of uh, responsibility. Um, so for me, if you have liability, reputation doesn't matter that much because reputation is in my eyes just a, a replacement for uh, liability. And I think the result that we have there, like I would need to go now into the details of the result, is that um, uh, reputation only has an effect if liability does not apply and if you don't have anything else, then actually it can be shown to be effective. Uh, and, and, and there are good reasons. Interesting, you, you could even make an... Um, uh, a homo economical standard economic based argument that if you have a little bit of reputation you allow uh, different types of behavior for for uh, most of the game um, so so that's for me the, the the first big insight like in very like if you talk about the insurance example it's very hard to hold an insurance agent uh, uh, liable for not providing you the right level of insurance when you asked him for that the right. end of the day, it's your decision, right? And therefore, given that you don't have liability in the market, reputation is is the best rep, uh, replacement of that. I uh, see. Um, and 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 in the experiment, we 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 can't really see that that much because we only have, for example, a limited limited number of rounds that we can play in an experiment, while the reputation is almost infinite if you think about your industry. Uh, because it's not just maybe you have only one interaction with uh, with uh, or, or only few interactions with with a certain client, but there are other people that know about that, and uh, you could really see there's an infinite number of interactions uh, that matter, and 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 reputation there can replace liability. 
That's pretty interesting. So you're saying that the presence of reputation in the actual insurance market is a kind of critique of the liability regime that's in place there. Because if the liability uh, constraints were stronger, you wouldn't need such a strong reputational element in the marketplace. Yes. And I think that's what I would say we, we do see in the experiments as well, that mm. uh, once you have uh, a good liability, your reputation doesn't matter that much. I, mean, I did notice in, your, in the way you structured the experiments where you simply prohibited somebody from under treating, right? And yes. you just said, can't do it. Whereas in the real world, you know, there's this messy kind of process whereby you can get away with it for mm -hmm. a little while. And so you're not going to just, stri you can't strictly prohibit kind of much of anything, really, because there's yeah. always a mechanism of enforcement. Uh, in your game, you can artificially uh, make that absolute, right? Yeah. Um, you know, I'd actually kind of a different interpretation of the of you're trying to reconcile reputation, because another another result, another interesting feature of of the of the credence good market, is that in, you make the point that in order for a, a the market to function, you have to have what you call equal markups, right? Mm -hmm. So, you have to have the the low quality good and then the high quality good have to have the same amount of profit available for the provider, and the reason why is that because. The, the consumers know this, and they know that they, they know that they, they understand incentives, right? Mm -hmm. And they know that if you're incented to give me the wrong kind of advice, and I don't know, you're the expert, you know what I should do. Then, if your incentives are wrong, that means that you're gonna you're gonna give me the wrong advice, right? So, yeah. to me, reputation becomes almost like a guidepost for like I felt like it was something similar to the idea of of creating trust to transact, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, because you don't always, at least in insurance, you don't always observe the markups that people are providing, mm -hmm. right? Um, so in this case, the reputation winds up as another kind of feature to make me feel comfortable to work with you. And then that was consistent with your with your findings in the experiments, where actually reputation increased the number of transactions which were occurring. Mm. Like, what do you think, Bob? Yeah, no, like I think we are not too far away from that, right? Mm. So what you point out is in, in a lot of industries, we you can't really observe what exactly are the markups for that reason um, um, we um, it, it's much harder to apply this this type of rationale but what reputation really does is do did I have good experiences in the past with you as, as my agent so to say or not so did I find out maybe after I like I ran into a couple of friends and I found out the deal that you found me isn't really the best that would be one way to think well you didn't really justify the trust that I put in you uh, into you, uh, but what it does is it forces you because you have now. If you, if you talk about a reputation, you have a reputation to lose, right? That's the, mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, yes. the argument here, and that gives me is what I would call is the substitute for this type of liability that I want to have. So um, hmm. you're completely right. If we can't have verifiability which is, I think, the example you set up, we, we do need to do something around liability. If we can't have it in a formal way, then reputation is, for me, the way to go. Um, uh, and, 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 and for me, that explains a lot of um, why reputation matters so much in, in many industries. You know, another, another feature of your experiments, which was which I sort of was deciding, trying to decide whether or not I, uh, it, it bothered me, was that they were, they were bilateral. Right, and so uh, you you didn't introduce the idea of a social reputation. So mm -hmm. uh, it looked to me like your reputation was I could go back to you as a provider, yes or no, as opposed to I can talk to the guy next to me and say, is he is Uwe um, a crook or not? I would say we have a little bit more in there, but um, uh, in the sense of you do see the reputation of of several people. So um, um, I think we looked at at the record that you know your own person but we also looked at the case that you can see how other customers have uh, ah, okay. feared with um, uh, what was their experience with interacting with a, with a different uh, expert like uh, the, the, the big challenge in in the lab and that's I think why we moved later to the field um, is yes like um, there we actually could look at social um, reputation because you just share with everybody but it's only a small group so right. how, how realistic that is, um, that, that is the challenge. I think in the, in, in the lab experiments, you try to ident like you, you, you try to separate one specific aspect and um, whether we chose the right ones or not is, is always an interesting question.
Well, I got over my problem anyway, but I think yeah. that it did introduce the um, the idea of the social mechanisms, right? So yeah. reputation is a social mechanism, uh, as is uh, this, uh, you know, as is this other idea, which is yet another paper, which I loved, um, which actually this one is my favorite, because the, the idea of different distribution channels allowing for price discrimination. So mm -hmm. that to me is a very powerful result, uh, at least one that's powerfully descriptive of the way the world works, as I understand mm -hmm. it or as you know it in insurance, because what you see is you see in the insurance industry a very fragmented distribution mechanism, right? Mm -hmm. And if you take the interpretation, an interpretation of your result there of saying, if I have to have equal markups for everybody, that means I have to treat everybody the same. But everybody's not the same, right? The heterogeneity or the homogeneity cr criterion, right, that's violated, right? So everybody's mm -hmm. different, but I have to treat everybody the same, otherwise they're all gonna think I'm lying, or they're, gonna, they're not gonna trust my ability to discriminate their heterogeneity, and mm -hmm. they're gonna think that I'm out to get them. So now what I have to do is I have to supply them through different channels, each of which serves a homogeneous group of customers, mm. right? And Uwe, that's, that's insurance. Like insurance is an amazing variety of distribution channels and it provides a wonderful example, a wonderful explanation for that because you need to have, you need to laser out a group of people and actually have them treated the same, but not, be, and, and the way that we typically interpret that in insurance is it's the regulator makes you do it. Make, and you know, there's, some, there's a way you analyze the data. There's artifacts of the data analysis. We have to group people in order to minimize the variance of the result and all this. Um, but actually it's, a distri it's an efficient distribution outcome because now the people in that segment trust you because you mm. know you're treating them all the same. That's an amazing mm. thing. And you did, you did it for c computer parts or something. That's where yeah, you yeah. derived the result. That was what was really cool. Yeah, like uh, the interesting thing is at that time, um, we really had this big transition in, in um, whatever, personal computing. Mm. Um, so, so at the time, I, I still remember talking to computer scientists. You talked about right sizing uh, computers with respect to the type of memory that they have. That's not a discussion today, yeah. Um, yeah. because it just became so cheap. Um, and that's exactly what I find was the powerful insight. And, and I, I don't know whether we are able to get that into the insurance industry as well and, and, and see a similar transition there. But maybe we we we, we can discuss that a bit more. Uh, for me, what was the powerful insight there is once this additional quality of service becomes very cheap, right? The, um, the relatively expensive expert service, the ability to diagnose what is needed becomes less and less important, right? right. So in, in the computer market, I found it interesting that we had highly specialized but more low quality computing in the uh, computing in the early times, very much, I would say, focused on like if we look talk about personal computers uh, at one end on, on, on whatever very specific gaming applications. So I don't know. Yep. Um, um, I don't know how old you are, but the C64 or the Sinclair computers and, and um, yeah, yeah, like C for Commodore. Very, I know that yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the very old um, uh, type, the very early days that computers somehow started to appear in, in, in our households. Um, were definitely more low quality. And then on the other end, you had whatever the mainframe big business computing that was very expensive, right? And you had some sort of experts that provided this high quality end of the market. And you could buy the, the Commodores um, at your corner store or um, maybe not the corner store, but, but uh, you know, some sort of uh, mass on some sort of mass market, not really with a lot of uh, advice, right? And and for me that made sense because in this low end market there wasn't much much um, uh, not not enough value to actually try to save on on memory or, or specific aspects. While at the high end market you really it, it made a big difference to get actually the type of of setup that fits your needs. Nowadays I think for for most applications even for small business you can buy uh, some sort of standardized setup and, and it does enough, especially when we talk about the cloud, you just need to be somehow connected to the cloud and therefore right sizing of this equipment is not that important anymore. Maybe right sizing of the service is important, but not or not, not the equipment. So that, that's what I found quite interesting and powerful to see that, you know, what are the areas in the economy where this expert advice that is somehow costly actually is merited by and I would really say in the way that you have an expert that can make sure that low quality does the job that you need to be done. So you don't need to invest in, in very high quality to ensure yourself that it always functions. The expert can say for what you want to do, the simple stuff does it. 
right? Mm. Like the good car mechanic that says, well, your car makes a funny noise, but I don't need to replace the whole muffler. I can just fix the one screw um, and, and, and then it's all good, right? The, the, the stuff that you have is still good enough. So that, that's the, um, the benefit that we get from expert services. I don't know whether okay. we get that to into insurance, but... Um, um, well, maybe come back to it, but here's like a general observation that I, I read in one of your papers, which said that up until that point, which I think was the mid 2000s, uh, and this is maybe changes that the vast majority of the data and analysis that have been done on Credence Good have been done in two markets, auto mechanics and healthcare, mm -hmm. right? Um, and I, I wonder maybe if you, th if you, th what you think about how limiting that scope might have been for earlier researchers and it, maybe it's changed now? Uh, that's a, it's a good question. Like I find it interesting when, when I look at, like I, mean, I still review a lot of papers that do very standard credence goods analysis. I, I do feel that economists are not particularly good to have a, 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 um, a bigger picture. So very often they work on, on very specific uh, examples and, and there are few people um, that are um, uh, that, that look a little bit further. Maybe it's the incentives in our market. Um, uh, maybe it's the problem that we talk here about microeconomics, so people are used to analyze very specific situations. Um, and then, what do they miss? What do you um, think they miss that, that you understand? You know, who's analyzed? Um, I forget what. Uh, market system, the Huku system in China. You've analyzed data yeah. security, right? I mean, so I, you're, you've ranged more widely. What what yeah. do you kind of see that they don't? Well, like I, I, for me the best example there is like look at the academic environment, and and a lot of uh, leading research comes out of big economics departments, right? Yeah. So if um, this is very different to the setup. Um, here at QUT. So here at QUT, it's a very small economics department and that made me, and I found that like when I first accepted the job, uh, it was just economically attractive. It was a nice place to live. So so um, that was what, what, what attracted me here. And I had two colleagues that I knew and, and valued and, and I thought, oh, you know, why not, why not do that? It, it, it's a good offer, um, time to move, do something different. Um, but what I found and started to really enjoy is that I, you start talking with very different people. So mm -hmm. I think um, like we have a local competitor here, which has a typical American sized big econ department. And, and what happens is people just talk to other economists and, and then you, you, you sit in your own um, silo and, uh, or, or ghetto and, and just talk uh, uh, with other people with a very narrow mindset. Um, what I enjoy being at a smaller university where you have a couple of cells of excellence is that you start w talking to a, whatever uh, information security specialist in, in that example and, um, and, and, and we started to talk about how does credence goods theory uh, matter for um, cyber security, information security um, systems and, and you start talking about that. Or, and what was the uh, answer to that question? Uh, well, we, we started to look at uh, more or less using ideas from credence goods theory and, and the game theory that we have there to improve mechanisms. Um, like in that uh, is, is, was, for example, the idea in, in, in the healthcare context to um, to say that, that by giving people budgets of access to data, uh, you could actually give people that are usually have a very hard time to access patient data, more access and more ability to choose what type of uh, data they need on a certain patient um, uh, than, than always involving whatever the, um, uh, the head doctor that, that would otherwise need to, to clear access. Uh, and, and the argument was more or less that, that people will know that they can only access so and so much data and if they access data wrongly at a time when they shouldn't, they will run out of more or less budget at the end uh, uh, of the month and people would then be able to identify that they actually use data where they shouldn't have uh, had access to data. So I, I found that quite interesting to use these mechanisms and, and transfer them in, into 
um, like take them further from from just abstract ideas to think about um, not only observing what happens on markets but actually engaging in, 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 in you could call it market designs. Um, what, what is the link to credence goods there? Because I mean, the one that comes to mind is that of reputation, right? Mm -hmm. Where you know you. I know whether or not I should access this data and the data provider gives it to me and has to trust me for a minute. Mm -hmm. But if I abuse that, then I lose the ability to transact. Is that, have I got that right? Or where yeah. is the credence well, like the, 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 the example that we discussed at that time and, and where this came from was um, like um, in a hospital setting, you have different patients. Patient data is, is protected by privacy. Um, but we do know that, let's say, the nurse um, that is looking after you sh for some, for administering, for example, certain medications, it would help if she gets access to some of your medical record. Yep. Uh, in most cases, the nurse itself can't do that and it just gets the order, so to say. Uh, or if it would want to access the, the, the record, you would need whatever the, the head, the chief. Um, the head of the department to to clear her from seeing that 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 seems to be a very simplified version of, of of this type of setup and the argument that we made there is saying applying game theory applying the credence goods argument the nurse itself is in the best position to judge how much excess of data she needs um, like whatever the, the head of department would be able to know that as well whether she should get that or not and we have this checks but it, it's costly that he actually or she needs to uh, um, to check on the nurse and, and and what is needed there instead of saying that we could say well you have a certain capacity to access data and we know let's say in a normal work week you need five times high private access uh, high privacy access and and the rest of the time normal access if we document that, we could say, well, if you don't go over the, your five times high privacy access, you get a automatic waiver. And that would make the system much more um, uh, effective. And it is this thing of, of um, um, like as, as you pointed out, people that need a certain type of data are the best judges about how much data they need in this situation. At the moment we have this, a lot of checks, not really checks and balances, really mainly checks let's say mm -hmm. we put it very high up in the chain of responsibility to clear people's access. That's very expensive if you think about um, like this head of department needing to, to grant access um, all the time. And the question is whether it actually then happens because it becomes then more or less automatic, right? So the checking may not even happen as we formally have it. So to me, to me that's like a, that's a pretty interesting expansion of the of the tools, right? Mm. Uh, you know, I, I think a little more prosaically, cre credence goods are appearing everywhere. I mean, look at look at online ordering of, of anything at all. I mean, mm. you're buying something, you don't know what you're going to get, and sometimes mm. it ain't good. <laughs> you yeah. have reputation systems, right? Again, um, you have you have free returns, liability, right? Yeah. Um, so it seems to me like I, I, I remain baffled at mm. how little known. The credence good uh, line of thinking is given that it's massive loss of importance in our society, and I, you know, I think I have a story too for kind of like what's going on there. I think that the increasing specialization of our economy requires narrower and narrower fields of expertise of greater and greater quality, and so we we you know, we're going to wind up having to go into all sorts of more specifically. Um, trained experts for kind of almost anything. Look at the medical profession. I mean, you don't really see general practitioners so much anymore. It's all these deeper and deeper experts. And I feel like mm. all professions are going that direction. So mm. to me, they all become more and more credence-like. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, like I, I, I would argue it's very, like I, I would make very similar uh, arguments there. Uh, just one thing that I want to take on, and it, it makes sense to think about that, um, like, like early in, 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 in the theoretical work on, on credence goods, we talk about this difference between uh, what I would call standard goods, like let's say your milk or your fuel you buy, right? So I sometimes say the example, when I talk to my students, uh, all the goods you are able, you're happy that your mother buys for you and um, or your, your, your parents or whoever, you, you are happy to delegate, right? Standardized goods, no problem. Then you have search goods um maybe clothing that we buy 
because you want to look at it before you buy it, but you can look at it. Yep. Uh, and that's really changes with, with the internet. The next thing that, that economists talked about is experience goods. And I, I just want to just quickly talk about that because I think the internet is a good example of an experience good. You more or less need to make the, 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 the you, you need to trust the expert, uh, not the expert, the, the seller um, in a sense of that the quality that is advertised on the internet is actually the, the quality that is delivered. So reputation there matters, right? Uh, same like in the literature, and, and it's, it's not a new concept. We like if you buy a bottle of wine, you just see the, the bottle, um, even if you buy it in a shop, uh, as long as you can't try it there, you have to more or less make this first trusting um, yes. decision to say, well, I, I trust the label or I trust the seller that it won't be complete, like un unbearable vinegar. Uh, yep. Yeah. Um, we can swear if you'd like. But yeah. you and, um, <laughs> and, um, and, uh, and then you like, it's more or less repeat business that really uh, makes this work, right? Mm. So you buy a certain brand, you like it or you don't like it. If you don't like it, you just don't buy it again. And you somehow hope that disappears. That's the, the, the experience good example. And, and we started out this discussion and, and uh, talked about how agricultural economists think about credence goods. And they have this type of perspective um, that um, uh, it's, it's a lot about, I can't observe the quality. The important thing is it's also, what do I need, right? So if we think about buying um, clothes in a shop, um, there are different quality levels. Let's say you look for some sort of function wear to go on a, on a hike in summer. Uh, and you would have the expert being able to tell you what is needed for the type of trip you, you, you do take. Uh, and that's much harder to provide, I guess, over the internet, but it can be done, right? Um, um, so, so that's for me the, the interesting thing where we, we have these differences between um, uh, the goods that, um, uh, that it's not just the quality where you need to have trust because the channels have changed um, and, and have become maybe more anonymous or so reputation becomes also harder. Uh, or more difficult, but it's also this what is needed to identify, like to what extent can you actually identify what is the need of a customer, where I think that's important. But I do feel that like the world gets more and more complex. Technology has become more and more complex and makes it much harder for all of us to actually choose what is really the option that, matter, that, that, that matches our needs. So I think we do have more and more um, um, specialization that is needed that where we rely on advice yeah i, I think that so to me that like specialization and intermediation mm -hmm. kind of go hand in hand right mm -hmm. so like if you have where once you had sort of one or two generalists now you have a whole plethora of specialists you'll need a guide right you need mm -hmm. somebody to say here's all the specialists hold my hand i'm going to tell you where to go right i'm going to tell mm -hmm. you which ones you need uh, and then you know we get the efficiency of of extraordinary expertise among specialists but we have this we have this need for the to to interpret that for the rest of us, and now we need mm -hmm. you know, now we need advice, and now we have you know another credence good pops up. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I'm long credence goods, mm -hmm. um, uh, in my intellectual uh, uh, forecasting of the future. Um, but on that note, uh, I am intrigued by one more. You know, we'll, we'll finish up on this topic, but one more strand of of your work, which is very recent, very recent, which is on evaluating the intersection between academic literature and patent research. Mm -hmm. And so to me, like, I think of the credence good angle here as being, what do we get for all these professors <laughs> that we are hiring? Uh, and there's like an interesting mechanism of output, which is patents into the economy. Mm -hmm. And that can generate kind of real outcomes for us in terms of economic growth, which is nice. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm intrigued by what you think of that, whether this becomes a a kind of evaluation of the output of academics in the sense of like uh, a value laden. Mm -hmm. um, they're the ones who are on your list of academics who publish papers that wind up in patent references are more productive in some sense than those who do not. Mm -hmm. Is that too bold? Um, like my interest or, or our interest um, there was slightly different. Um, Maybe first to, to make the connection between um, the discussion that we just had in the patent literature or, or academic output in general. Um, I think it's interesting to see um, 
that uh, this type of literature actually requires experts to make it accessible. Right. So right. for me, uh, the interesting thing is when I started to have these discussions with with a co-author or, uh, or co-authors that are on on this paper to 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 look at the connection between the academic and and, and the patent literature, um, was that for a long time IP was actually a not very well organized literature. So mm. that we had the the type of progress that you have more or less now uh, Google's for patents search mechanisms that can actually and, and that's what i think um a lot of of, of the, the type of search algorithms and, and programs that we have now have done for us they were able to actually organize uh, um, a very unstructured literature so the way i think about ip is it was even uh, worse much worse than the academic literature because it wasn't very structured like I always, if, if I talk to um, to colleagues and I say, you know, the way to think about the patent, the, the, the knowledge, the patent uh, knowledge before the arrival of, of modern library search techniques, uh, it's it's all of this was like like really a, a, like a, a big archive that wasn't particularly well organized, more or less by time, and 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 you couldn't really navigate the knowledge well. And that was used to some extent by by large corporations, right? So if you think about the patent knowledge, which gives you a, a right to exclude others, uh, you actually don't want to know, um, um, or you don't necessarily want a competitor to know what you can exclude the competitor from, because that way you actually reduce competition. So this uncertainty for some players in the market uh, made a lot of sense. Uh, it also led to uh, um, giving a certain types of experts a lot of power, namely if you can navigate this type of yep. not very well organized um, um, uh, information, then you have a lot of power, right? Because you can tell people what's happening there, but a big investment, not very efficient. Um, so so the type of mapping, a mapping exercise actually came about how can we bring the right experts together with um, um, the people that want to apply this type of, of knowledge, right? So um, th that's how I thought about it. So the, the mapping and trying to understand where, you know, what are the, 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 the academic researchers, what are the industry, um, the people that are able to turn knowledge ideas into products, services, commercially valuable uh, outcomes. How can we bring them together? That's much more um, um, the way how I see that. Um, so, so connecting the right expert to the right problem um, in, in, in many ways. I'm, I'm like I, I can see, and I think it's important for, from a society perspective to actually have a better idea about what are um, what are contributions to the advancement of knowledge. And 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 I agree that part of the work is really there to say well we should be cautious like uh, we, we talked about you know what is the academic environment that brings you to interesting ideas um, and we have the problem of the ivory towers and I'm not just one ivory tower several ivory towers that, yeah. that write their own uh, game and and I'm definitely as, as we discussed before I'm, I'm very much into um, getting people more out of their own little corner and, and, and interacting more because I for myself find it much more exciting. I also believe it's much more useful from a, from a, from a, from a um, um, social perspective. Um, but as the credence a good person, I, I, I'm really reluctant to push harder for using this as a, um, as a, a way to evaluate <coughs> academics because I find it problem uh, the problem is that that the type of advice they provide may be <laughs> different for that reason if they're too much driven by the incentives uh, indeed so i was intrigued just when i was kind of like poking around in there i mean you're on there for your mm -hmm. cybersecurity work uh mm -hmm. which is super interesting um you, you know i would say as an academic you're certainly uh uh you know most well known for credence goods literature but then mm -hmm. here you are with this tiny little kind of strange detour you made 
Um, and now in the world of patents, that's who you are. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You're the guy who helped design this interesting kind of like gating mechanism for people to get more data. And you know, I was looking for all sorts of economists on there, and I found you know a, a lack of correlation completely with the the you know the ranking of citations of economists and patents. Right, mm -hmm. so that's kind of interesting. Um, what are you really doing out there? Uh, and then, um, you know, if you go to, if you venture into more liberal arts, like I put, put in a couple of philosophers and stuff, and this is mm. something, right? They, didn't, mm. they weren't cited any patents. Um, you know, Daniel Kahneman's and, and you know, 25 or so, which that feels about right, uh, in terms of behavioral economists. So, I mean, I was intrigued by the idea of, of this sort of like, I don't know, completely distinct and independent evaluation of quality of an academic academics uh, output. Um, and and so like in some ways, I imagine a lot of academics would not like it because they would feel it's threatening to their expertise. Mm. Perhaps I'm not sure. What has been the reaction to that? Uh, you, like I, <laughs> um, it's an interesting question. Like the economists don't really care because, uh, and, and I think one of the reasons is that that um, um, maybe in general with the social sciences. Um, a lot of the work we do is is producing for the commons or, or for the public uh, public goods right it's 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 very abstract i think very often very useful knowledge but it's not knowledge that that i feel is particularly well protected by um uh, by whatever the ip type of setup mm -hmm. uh, like there is a big discussion in in, in the patent literature about uh, the business methods patents and I personally think um, it doesn't make much sense to to protect business methods by uh, uh, by patents because there's not like it's it's very often ideas um, they change relatively quickly um, the IP system is not particularly fast to react no. to to this this type of thing. So what you actually have is when when the most of the benefits of a of a certain uh, business method have been developed. The system hasn't yet come into place and then you protect something that is, is more or less legacy protection um, it doesn't make much sense for me uh, and and for that reason I think um, a lot of the economists don't care about it I do feel and, and that was the, the push that, that I feel that we try to do with this work is that there's a lot of data uh, that would be interesting to study from an economics perspective that we currently not that, that is not studied at, at much depth. There, there are pockets of, of research in this field, but it's, um, um, yeah, I feel it's an under, under researched area. And it came out of work where I had discussions with uh, a colleague of mine that was building this, this um, patent database, the lens, um, um, uh, about you know what? What is the economy about that? How do people engage with this abstract knowledge? To what extent are experts in this field, patent lawyers, um, um, uh, really helping? What happens there? To what extent do they hindering to actually get innovation out to to reach its full benefit? So, last question: What are you working on next? What's the next frontier of credence goods for you? Uh, like if, for for me, like we currently do a series of papers where we actually try to find out. Like we we talked about the role of experts uh, to try to find out who actually makes the decision when you have this type of credence good situation, right? So I think in the medical context, it's most obvious. Um, if if you have a certain health problem, do you actually feel that you at the end of the day decide about um, the treatment, or is it the doctor? Uh, and 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 in, in the, the the early papers that we have, uh, a couple of these papers out now, what we find is that is not clear. It's definitely no agreement there that both patient and doctor believe that the patient makes the decision, which would be somehow what we assume from an institutional setup and from a legal setup. Um, and I find that fascinating and interesting. So who actually? is in control uh, and I think there are lots of implications that would have from a, from a legal perspective as well uh, but it becomes difficult right it's um, like if you look at the, the economics literature it's a little bit this type of discussion about formal and real authority um, so who can make actually a decision and and to what extent do fee like do fee people really feel they just received advice but then make the decision 
or they delegated the decision in a credence goods context. That's, um, um, I find, a very important question and um, uh, it, it really applies th through all these different applications of, of credence goods um, uh, work. My guest today is Uwe Dulek. Uwe, thank you very much. Thanks, David.